moved up here because of this beautiful place that we live. Um, and now we're confronted with how are we going to live with fire um, here in this beautiful place? And how can we um, build a resilient landscape around us and be able to be um, friends with fire, figure out how to live with fire? Um, so I thought one of the ways that I would kind of center us in the importance of nature and, and living where we, we are in this beautiful nature is to read just a quick Wendell Berry um, quotation from The Peace of Wild Things. I don't know if you know Wendell Berry, but he's an extraordinary human being who is an environmentalist, a poet, um, a, a writer, just a, a, a farmer, a very um, interesting and... and um, uh, writes wonderful po prose, so I just wanted to share this with you. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound, in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in the beauty of the water, and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things, who do not tax their lives with forethought, who, uh, or grief. I, I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light for the time I rest in the grace of the world and am free. So I just wanted to share that with you and, and again center us in the importance of nature and the beauty that we live in and we can do that and still be fire safe. So I, at this time I am going to turn it over to Ellie um, and the rest of our wonderful speakers today. Um, and thank you all for being here. Okay, so everybody see my, can see my uh, screen, the Firewise and Resilient Landscaping, I hope. We sure can. Somebody speak up if you can. What's that? We sure okay. can. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, and thank you all for joining us. Um, Priscilla, that was a beautiful poem, and I have to confess I was feeling a little nervous, uh, you know, getting ready for this, and up until you finished that poem, and now I just feel amazingly calm, because it's, uh, it's exactly where we're coming from, and, and uh, I really, really thank you for starting with that. Um, so I'm, I'm a landscape architect with a specialty in natural habitat restoration, and I'm also a board member of the Sonoma Ecology Center. And I'm happy to be the first of three panelists on the subject of firewise and resilient landscaping. Garden as if life depends on it refers to the importance of protecting life by maintaining the defensible space around the home, but also taking care of the wildlife and the habitat that we share. So briefly about the Ecology Center, and, I, and I'm going to stay on this slide while I tell you about it because this is a, an example of what we're trying to accomplish here with our, our aim to help people create defensible space that's beautiful, sustainable, and biodiverse. And um, this is a native heuchera, which is a, a wonderful firewise plant that grows well in the shade or part sun and under oaks. And it's a really good example of um, just the sort of general approach that we want to take. So just briefly about the Ecology Center, our mission is to work with our community to identify and lead actions that achieve and sustain ecological health in Sonoma Valley, but also more broadly <clears throat> in the county of Sonoma and further. The Ecology Center has professional staff uh, that can help evaluate and implement vegetation management on both wildlands and the more, <clears throat> excuse me, intimate defensible space area. We operate with attention to the sensitivities of the ecological system with the result of a healthier, more sustainable landscape with lower fire hazard. So we also have expertise to design and install firewise gardens or retrofit your existing landscape. And um, after the 2017 fires, which just really burned more than 30% of Sonoma Valley, um, the Ecology Center began leading fire recovery walks into the burned landscapes, partly to reassure ourselves and to try to understand, you know, how are we going to recover from this and how does, how does the habitat recover and can it help teach us something? And we really drew a lot of inspiration from that. But in the process, um, we met a lot of people who were really understandably traumatized 
and as, as many of you may be, because I know that there's been a lot of fire moving through your landscapes as well. But we learned that many people in their sort of confusion were clearing in the defensible space, that 100 feet around the house and just like removing all vegetation and you know, unintentionally creating problems of er more erosion or invasive plant species coming back. And uh, a lot of those invasive plants are highly ignitable and then the loss of wildlife habitat. But we knew other people who were hesitating to do anything because they were confused and they'd been nurturing their gardens for decades and didn't want to take anything out and didn't know really what to do. So um, since then, there's been a lot more education. I know Fire Sonoma has been doing a lot, the county's been doing a lot, and I think there's been a lot of improvement in the education. And, and we've been teaming up with all of those agencies to try to provide a little bit more specifics about what people can do. So our team, it's the Resilience Land, Resilient Landscapes Coalition, we formed about 18 months ago um, when members of these organizations, myself from the Sonoma Ecology Center, along with Caitlin Cornwall and Jason Mills, and Mimi Enright from the UC Master Gardener Program of Sonoma County, who's the program manager, and also Cleo Tarazi. She's the board president of, of that organization, and she's also our moderator today. So you're gonna be seeing Cleo and hearing from Cleo as we move along. And then April Owens, who is the executive director of the Habitat Corridor Project, and she's also the um, horticulture chair of the Native Plant Society for our local area. And we've been doing this in partnership with the um, fire professionals. So Roberta McIntyre of FireSafe Sonoma has been deeply involved with this, um, with this presentation and the work we're doing. And the County of Sonoma Fire Prevention Division, including Carolyn Safford and James Williams. And we've also been working with Linda Collister, who's on the presentation today. And, um, and we're really happy that, that we're joined today as a panelist with um, Chief Marshal Tuberville, who's um, the battalion chief for the Russian River area. And he basically covers all of North County. So uh, he's gonna be available with questions at the end. Oh, and I also, back to that, I wanted to mention this team has spent countless hours in partnership with Fire Safe Sonoma and the County um, Fire Prevention Division. We wanted to make sure that we vetted our content through their lens to make sure that we weren't recommending things that people would have to tear out later when the inspector came. And we realized that we have, we often, we came in with a different perspective. Uh, when we saw the ecology perspective, we saw a landscape with shrubs and trees and we saw wonderful habitat, but fire professionals will see that same landscape and, and they'll see, you know, potential fire ladders and the opportunity for a fire to go from the ground all the way up into the trees and then, you know, they're off to the races. So it was, it was really important for us to bring both perspectives and we've really accomplished that. So an overview of our agenda, I'm gonna be, we're doing this 20 minutes right now where I'm gonna talk about regulations really briefly, just one slide uh, for you to be aware of. And then talking about the wildland urban interface, kind of give an overview of where we are now. And then how to, <clears throat> within the defensible space, look at the ecology and sustainability. And then Mimi is gonna be talking about design and maintenance principles for about 45 minutes. A little bit of an overview, but getting more specific. And then April's gonna be going into specific examples of what to do in your garden with a focus on native plants. So, Briefly about regulations, it is the landowner's responsibility to be familiar with state and county regulations and <clears throat> in the defensible space zone. So there's the state public resources code 4291. And I think Cleo is gonna put the link to that in the chat box. And then there's the Sonoma County ordinance chapter 13A, which basically encompasses the state code and refines it a little bit. So as long as you're following the county ordinance, you should be okay. And I should mention that um, 
There are re additional requirements and restrictions if you're in the very high fire hazard severity zone. And I'll show you a map. And I think we can also put a link so you can find out whether you're in that area or not. Um, and Mimi will be going into more detail about what the codes are and how you can meet them. And then if you're along the stream side or if you are in the wildland areas, it's really important to know what other regulations are in place. So there are other county regulations. There's the riparian corridor combining zone to know about. State Fish and Wildlife and the Regional Water Quality Control Board also have some rules to be aware of. And there are federal agencies like the Army Corps of Engineers. So the basic message here is just to be careful when you're about to do any sort of substantial vegetation management. So on the subject of the wildland urban interface or intermix, um, most of you know this, I'm sure, but it's an area where homes and associated structures are built among or adjacent to forest, shrubs, and grasslands. And climate change plus fire suppression, which we've been doing for the last 150 years, plus increased development in the wildlands results in increased fire risk. And one of the, the there's a few points that are really important to, to take away from this is when houses are built in the wildlands, there naturally, there naturally will be more wildfires due to human ignitions because there are just more people there. Um, and it's usually unintentional. You know, we all know about PG&E uh, initiated fires. Also wildfires that occur in this area will pose a greater risk to lives and homes because there are more people and homes there. And they will be harder to fight for the same reason. <clears throat> a lot of times firefighters have to go in and protect the houses because people have left things on their porches and they're burning and you know, the firefighter can't really go and, and do the rest of their job. Um, and letting fires burn in the wildland urban interface isn't possible. You can't do fire suppression. So we can't actually clean out some of the undergrowth with natural fire. Um, so fire suppression continues to be necessary. So this is a, a map of the, um, the fire hazard severity zones. And I'll get my, where is it? I wanna get my pointer, here we go. So this is the Mayakamas Ridge right along here. This is the Napa-Sonoma um, dividing line. <clears throat> this is Santa Rosa, Windsor, Healdsburg. So you can see the bright red areas are the high fire, the very high fire severity zones. And those are areas that have more um, specific or, or uh, more elaborate restrictions, both for building your home as well as for doing your defensible space. And um, so I'll show you some, some more interesting maps where showing where the fires have been since 2017. Um, so you can actually find this map. I can put the address in the chat after the presentation. So this is a, a really interesting map that shows wildfires from 2017 through 2020 so far made by the Agricultural Preservation and Open Space District. And they have some really amazing maps that they're developing with their GIS program. But um, this is the glass fire here and here over in Napa. Um, this is the area of the Tubbs fire. This is the Kincaid fire. So here's Healdsburg right here. And then here's the Wallbridge fire. So you can see, and it's, it's almost, it makes me speechless just how much how much impact we've had from fire um, since 2017. And this is another, the map is interesting because it shows the vegetation, <clears throat> the vegetation types that were affected. And um, I encourage you to go on the Ag and Open Space website to see if you can find these maps and others. But um, I also wanted to mention about, about the um, incidence of fire prior to colonization and subsequent fire suppression wildfires in California burn on an average of 4 million acres each year, which is actually equivalent to our record setting year in 2020. So we had about 4 million acres burned throughout California. Um, back in the old days, Native Americans actually intentionally lit fires uh, in order to improve their food sources and their fiber sources. It was easier to hunt if you had more clear understory. Um, 
so those fires though had much lower intensity because there weren't as many, there wasn't as much of a fuel load. And in some cases, studies have shown that as many as 13 million acres burned in back when the Native Americans were managing the landscape. So you can imagine the, the uh, summer skies were smoky the way, maybe not as intensely as we experienced it though. So my next set of maps here show the expansion of development into the wildlands or expansion of the wildland urban interface. The left map here, it shows the extent of the Hanley fire. This is um, Santa Rosa, the 101 Carter and Healdsburg up here. I believe it's Healdsburg, it might be Windsor. But you can see the yellow area is low density housing. And you can see since 1964 in the 45 years, the extent of low density development that has moved into the wildlands. And if this map extended further north, I think it would show it um, pretty intensely there. So um, many people say that we need to avoid building more in the wildland urban interface, but since we've done it, and one of the effects is that um, we fragmented wildlife habitat. And so it's difficult for any plant and animal species and the entire ecological system to thrive when it's fragmented in this way. So um, now that we're in here though, it's our responsibility to take care of our neighbors and both human and wildlife. So this is the part where I get to talk about ecology and sustainability in the defensible space zone, which is my favorite subject. Um, it's important to take care of all our neighbors, since in a very real sense, we have displaced species by moving in. And Douglas Tallamy, who is a wonderful entomologist, um, an insect scientist, and I recommend his book, Bringing Nature Home. Um, he promotes the idea of making our gardens into habitat oases. He opens his book, Bringing Nature Home, with the statement, for the first time in history, Gardeners have become important players in the management of our nation's wildlife. So our gardens can provide habitat, really important ecosystem services. And April will be talking more about this and uh, can show how some of these plants that are in here and that one plant with the butterfly on it is a um, coyote mint, it's a native plant and it's absolutely beautiful and it's also firewise. So how do we bring these ecosystem services into our gardens? Um, so we wanna support biodiversity and I'll talk a little bit about how we do that. Uh, and I will also talk about how to enrich soil and hold it in place. We wanna clean and manage water, the four S's, slow it, sink it, spread it, store it. And we can se sequester carbon in our landscapes and we can also support pollinators. So I'm gonna start with biodiversity, which is defined as the web of life above and below ground, including the plants, animals, fungi, and microorganisms. And I think everyone has been hearing about the insect apocalypse, so-called. Um, in 2017, a German study reported a decline of more than 75% in insect biomass across a large number of nature areas in Germany between 1989 and 2016. And those are nature areas. Those are areas that aren't being sprayed with um, insecticides or herbicides. So that's a, it's a pretty serious situation. And, and also there's been a huge drop in monarch butterflies. Less than 3% of the 1980 numbers have been found in recent years. And there's also evidence from Australia that indicates insect declines there as well. And the problem is that insects aren't that well studied. So we're getting these kind of snapshots around the world, but they're all saying the same things. Um, insects, however, are a foundation of many of, of like all life systems. And um, from a perfectly selfish perspective, they pollinate um, not only wildlife plants, but those that people rely on for food. So it's really important that we keep our insects happy. And so for supporting biodiversity, the ways that we can do it are choosing native species. Um, and what we like to recommend is 70 to 80% of your garden would be planted in natives. Um, many insects actually rely on specific plants that they've evolved with for millennia. So we do want to concentrate on natives, which leaves 20 to 30% for your favorite non-natives. 
plant islands for wildlife food and shelter and April and Mimi will be talking about that in more detail. Use integrative pest management. So instead of using herbicides or pesticides, there are many ways that you can manage um, and that the UC Master Gardener program has a lot of information on that and provide a water source like a really shallow bird bath can make a huge difference. And um, this, the butterfly in the lower right is an example of a species that relies on a particular type of, of plant. And this is the pipe vine swallowtail. You see them around in the summertime quite a bit. And they lay their eggs exclusively on the pipe vine. It's, it's uh, the local pipe vine is called Aristolochia californica. And the, their caterpillars eat only the pipe vine. So if you can, um, I encourage everyone to, to plant pipe vine. It's actually really satisfying to watch the caterpillars grow. So another way to support biodiversity if you live in an oak woodland is to keep your oaks healthy. And they're incredibly productive food factories for wildlife. They're, they're considered the highest productivity of, of basically any plant in, you know, California or even worldwide. So they provide the food that supports the birds that we love, like quail and bluebirds and robins, but they also provide food for, so those, those birds that I just described eat the insects that, and the caterpillars that grow on the, in, in great profusion on the oak trees, but they also support invertebrate and vertebrate species, including squirrels and deer. Um, it's important to protect the root system, including minimizing any irrigation, compaction, or digging within the drip line. And the plant shown in this picture is a native plant. This is the coral bells that I showed you in the beginning, except with a white flower. It doesn't need a lot of irrigation, so it's really good for planting under oaks. And for oak health, it's equally important to keep a couple of inches of leaf litter which feeds the microorganisms in the root system. And you can do that as long as you're you know, more than five or 10 feet away from your home. You, it's totally fine to have organic matter of two inches. So you don't need to clean your, around your oak trees, um, you, but you don't want more than two inches. So for this uh, supporting sustainability and defensible space, you wanna hold the soil in place. So you definitely want plants in the landscape, especially on slopes. Um, and, and Mimi and April will talk about more of that. And uh, encourage water to infiltrate. So if you have downspouts, you can create rain gardens. And uh, this also helps protect water quality by reducing runoff. And this is just my token slide for avoiding erosion. You definitely don't wanna over clear because a hillside like this will have invasive species wanna come in and it will be erosive and be a real problem with water quality and provide no wildlife habitat. So sequestering carbon, if you think back to my oak woodland picture and, and basically think of any landscape, what you, what you need for the trees and the plants to absorb CO2 and sequester it in their tissues is you need really healthy soil. And plants and soil sequester carbon. So the plant draws it in and it draws it down into its tissues, but it also transmits it into the soil. And the soil is capable of holding more carbon dioxide than the atmosphere or above ground um, plant and animal life combined, not including the stuff in the ocean. Uh, so it's an incredibly underutilized resource. And if you take care of your garden and your plants and your soil, you're also really helping sequester carbon. So um, I just wanna make a couple more points with vegetation management. If you're doing any substantial vegetation management, timing is everything. So if you do have to go in and clear up some, um, I don't like to use the word clear vegetation, you're gonna be pruning it and you're gonna be managing it and maintaining it, and maintaining it in a way that doesn't promote fire. Um, the best time to do it is because birds are breeding, they're nesting, they're raising their young between March and August, um, the best time to do any substantial vegetation management is September through February. So right now is a good time because the birds aren't breeding. And pretty much my last point is it doesn't really seem to have much to do with defensible space, but it really has a lot to do with biodiversity and habitat light pollution can make it really hard for insects to um, 
find mates. They're, they're, we think that at least 50% of insects are nocturnal. And that means they're looking for food and their mates at night. So if we're uplighting our trees um, you know, for any length of time, they have a really hard time doing that. So I really recommend that if you're gonna be doing any sort of lighting like this, you put it on a timer or you just, you uh, have it as a motion sensor. And in the lower left is our native firefly. And I use it to illustrate this point because we do have fireflies that locate each other to mate by their faint little light. So it's important that they find each other. And with that, I'd like to kick it off to Mimi Enright um, and she will take it to the next step. Good morning. Um, sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, my name is Mimi Enright. And um, thank you, Ellie, for that wonderful introduction and um, uh, background on um, how we've evolved as a group with the work that we've been doing together. Um, so hopefully you all are familiar with the Master Gardener program. Um, we, uh, Master Gardener programs were agents of the University of California. And um, uh, we extend the research and education of the university to the communities that we serve. And after the 2017 wildfires, um, we really, our program really did a deep dive into um, all the content out there on defensible space and um, but to really try to synthesize and simplify th that content for our community. Um, and then, um, as Ellie mentioned, about 18 months ago, we came together um, to really try to marry the principles of sustainable landscaping, which Ellie did such a really beautiful job of articulating for us with the defensible space principles and to really try to um, focus in on recommendations to kind of translate those defensible space guidelines into recommendations within the, um, the zero to five, five to 30 and 30 to 100 foot zones in our home landscapes from a design and a maintenance perspective. So um, I'm gonna be covering this morning, um, I'm gonna be flying through a lot of content uh, in 45 minutes. Um, so bear with me as we, we move through um, a lot of information that we want to share with you this morning. I'm going to st start off with a very brief touch into some fire basics, uh, then move into um, the design and maintenance considerations um, uh, in designing for fire, uh, including plant selection considerations. Uh, we'll go into specifics on recommendations in those different zones in defense your defensible space zone, that zero to 100 foot zone around your home. Uh, touch briefly on mulch and then uh, end with some discussion on maintenance. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on, um, on uh, how fire operates and the aspects of fire. Uh, I really, that's really the, the bailiwick and expertise of our fire officials. But very basically for um, content uh, that's relevant to what we're discussing this morning. Um, fire is comprised of three elements and that is fuel, oxygen, and heat and fire behavior is based on fuel, weather, and topography. And of these elements, what we have the most control over managing is that fuel element. Uh, and fuel is very basically uh, anything that will burn. Uh, that could be uh, vegetation in our landscapes, landscape mulch, fencing, roofing, decks, lawn furniture, or arbors, trellises, and planter boxes. And there are three main ways that fire can move into our uh, home landscape and to our homes. And that is via direct flame exposure or radiant heat or embers. And the bulk of the fire ignitions um, of our homes um, are um, from ember ignition as we are all uh, much too familiar with here in Sonoma County. So uh, I wanted to share that um, the principles of defensible space were developed um, by uh, Jack Cohan with the US Forest Service. Um, and um, research that uh, Jack and the Forest Service conducted found that during wildfires, home ignition is primarily related to um, vulnerabilities on the structure itself, as well as those fuels within 100 feet and really was the first development of that defensible space principle. So it's important to consider what your goal is in preparing for the next fire. Certainly uh, your family's safety uh, and the safety of your structure, your home, but it's also incredibly important for us to consider um, uh, our firefighter safety as well. 
um, and how we can um, best uh, create access and uh, a safe environment for them uh, in the event of a wildfire when they're coming in to protect our home. So uh, as, as you all, many of you all are members of a COPE group. I'm a member of a COPE group myself. Uh, I live uh, northeast of Cloverdale um, uh, in the old Preston community at the base of Pine Mountain in a very high fire severity zone. Uh, uh, and that one of those red zones depicted on the map that Ellie was showing earlier. Uh, and it's, it's incredibly important that we all recognize that our actions are key uh, in helping uh, defend um, our homes in, uh, in face of future fire events. Um, and as we all very sadly know, there is no such thing as a fireproof home, uh, especially in the extreme uh, conditions that we have experienced here in Sonoma County. Um, but what you do um, can help reduce your risk. Um, there are no guarantees, unfortunately, as we also all know, all know, you can do everything that you should to be as best prepared as you can and very sadly lose your home or do none of the work and have your home survive. Um, but it is incredibly important um, uh, to do the work. Um, the work that we do is the best and most effective defense for our home. Uh, and as we're also very uh, aware, increasingly there is much more fire than there are firefighters, especially in the early days of the fires. We've all seen how um, stretched thin our firefighting resources are. So uh, one of the most important concepts is to start at your home. Um, there's a lot of great content and information out there on home hardening. Um, that's uh, where our presentation today is focused on the landscape, the defensible space around your home, that zero to 100 feet. But the most important starting point you can do is to start at your house and work out. And there's lots of great resources out there on hardening, hardening your home. Um, uh, I'm sure share, uh, Cleo can share a link for you to a UC resource uh, that can give you some guidance on that. So you want to start at the house and then work out through the zones of defensible space. Okay, so these are our basic principles for creating a firewise and sustainable landscape. You want to make sure that all plants in your landscape are um, selected and placed carefully and regularly maintained and hydrated. You want to design for ease of maintenance. Maintenance is one of the most important practices that we can do to keep a, um, our um, defensible space prepared on an ongoing basis. So you want to make sure you have ease of access to your plant materials for maintenance. Each home and landscape is unique and really has to be considered individually. We want to do what is required by law and of course uh, use science to inform your decisions. So most of the information that we're sharing in this presentation um, uh, is uh, some of it is science based and some of it is best known practices um, uh, by firefighting personnel. So and we'll clearly point out to you what is science based information uh, and what is um, based on best practices. Uh, and we'll also be pointing out to you um, where there are county code requirements. We'll have those items highlighted in red on the bullet points. Okay, so to create a firewise landscape, you want to um, follow some basic practices. You want to choose fire resistant landscape materials. So that means selecting uh, metal fencing to especially where it connects to your house or um, gravel mulch uh, in a perimeter in the five foot perimeter around your home. Um, you also want to arrange your landscape plants with spacing to disrupt fire right to break the, um, the flow of that fire from the landscape to your home. And you want to ensure that your landscape, um, you're maintaining your plants in a well irrigated, healthy and well pruned fashion. Okay, so uh, here's where we start uh, illustrating where uh, we've got county code requirements. So those, these county code requirements are highlighted in red on your screen. So to create a firewise landscape, you want to remove any dead or dying shrubs. Uh, trees or branches, and you want to be doing that on a year round basis. You also want to avoid planting close to structures, especially near vents, under windows or exposed eaves. And you want to prune tree limbs up at least six feet from the ground or one third the uh, uh, height of a tree. So, if, for example, if you have a smaller tree that is, say, 12 feet in height, um, you would want to prune that tree up four feet from the ground and then continue to maintain that uh, as it grows. So 
sorry, I'm still struggling with my screen issues. You guys and I apologize. I'm going to try to get that under control. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, it's also important to, um, uh, and is a county code requirement to have um, reflective address, street and address signs. You want to have four inch minimum reflective lettering on a contrasting background. Make sure that that's clearly visible from the street or access road in both directions um, and have those um, on metal posts. So um, uh, very important to consider, as I mentioned earlier, alternatives to wood fences. There's some great um, uh, different options other than wood from a design perspective that you can consider, uh, such as concrete or rock walls. Uh, and um, absolutely within the, um, uh, you do not want to have a uh, wood fence or gate connecting to your home as that tr transmits fire directly to your home. Okay, now let's touch base on um, FireWise plant selection considerations. So um, probably one of the most popular questions we get at the Master Gardener program is, um, can you provide me with a FireWise plant list? And um, uh, the University of California does not advocate for um, uh, firewise or fire resistant or fire prone plant lists because there is not scientific consensus on um, the components that would contribute to one plant being more flammable than another. Um, so we instead like to um, uh, uh, focus on the design and maintenance aspects we think that it can actually this be misleading for folks to, to pick a plant from a fire resistant plant list and put it in their garden and think that they're then safe when in fact the design and placement of that plant and their landscape and then the ongoing maintenance of it are much more important considerations. So in terms of um, plant selection considerations, it's incredibly important to consider how large a plant will grow. Uh, that's going to affect where you're going to place that plant, uh, it, the fuel load and maintenance that it creates in your garden, and um, whether it's going to um, uh, conflict with PG&E lines. It's also important to consider if the plant will thrive where you're planting it, which can affect the health and vin vigor as well as flammability of your plant. Are you selecting a plant uh, that is happiest in full shade and putting it in full sun? that will absolutely affect the health and vigor of that plant over its lifespan. Will the plant require more maintenance than you can provide now or in the future? That will in, uh, impact the volume of fuel load in your uh, home landscape. Is it invasive, uh, which can affect fuel load over a much wider or broader landscape? Uh, and it's also important to consider how a plant changes over its lifespan, which can also affect the fuel load. For example, a very popular landscape plant that people select is uh, lavender, um, which starts out um, very herbaceous or non-woody, but does become much more woody over time. Um, so you really want to think about um, the aspects of a plant over its lifespan as well. So it's important to note that all plants will burn. Uh, even if you are choosing something from a fire resistant plant list, all plants will burn. Uh, this is a picture of some, uh, some cactus and succulents in the Fountain Grove area after the 2017 wildfires. Um, and so that same aspect of consideration that we really want to make sure that all our landscape plants are as healthy as they can be with appropriate watering, um, uh, proper pruning, and upkeep to reduce risk. Okay, so where shouldn't you be planting uh, around your uh, home in your uh, defensible space zone? So um, there is scientific research that supports um, creating an ember defense zone in the zero to five foot perimeter around your home. And I'm gonna be spending some more time on this in some more detail uh, a little later in the presentation. So the recommendation is uh, no plants in the zero to five foot zone around your house perimeter. You also don't wanna plant under vents or eaves in front of windows or combustible siding under or near decks, and on inside corners of homes. Okay, hopefully you're all familiar with the concept of ladder fuels. Um, you want to reduce the possibility of having the fire move um, through the landscape from low grasses or ground covers into larger shrubs that then transmit that fire up into the crown of the trees. 
So you want to avoid placing shrubs or tall grasses under trees. Um, and the recommendation is to allow three times the height of the shrub between it and the lowest tree limb. Uh, and again, um, we want to be limbing up all those trees at least six feet up from the ground or one third the height of the tree. Okay, so these are um, CAL FIRE recommendations for um, ideal spacing guidelines within the defensible space zone. And I want to stress that um, these aren't a code requirement. Um, uh, these aren't um, backed or supported by scientific research as of yet, um, but they are the best um, recommendations that we have um, based on experience of our fire officials. So it's very important to consider the degree of slope when you're looking at your spacing of your trees and shrubs. So if you have a zero to 20% degree slope, the recommendation is to um, have trees spaced 10 feet apart and ha have shrubs separated by a space of two times the height of the tallest shrub in that shrub grouping. And then of course, with greater degrees of slope, um, the um, spacing is recommended uh, to be increased. Um, so this is a graphic. These are great graphics that, um, that were very kindly developed by our partner, Ellie Inslee. Um, many of the traditional graphics we see around tree spacing are based on um, historic um, uh, forest-based uh, ecologies. Um, so Ellie's uh, kindly translated those into uh, something that we see more, more typically in our landscapes. So uh, again, um, the recommendation is for tree spacing on a uh, less than 20% slope of 10 feet apart on a 21 to 40% slope of 20 feet apart, uh, and then on a, a, a sharper degree slope of 41% or more uh, to space trees uh, 30 feet apart. And I want to point out that, um, that there's uh, many different types of recommendations and guidelines around tree spacing. Um, the previous graphics were depicting CAL FIRE spacing recommendations, and these are recommendations from the National Fire Protection Association on tree spacing within the zero to 100 foot um, defensible space around your home. And you can see that they have a slightly different spacing recommendation that they, that they recommend. Okay, so let's move into um, the different defensible space zones around your home. And we're going to start with the, the zero to five foot um, zone uh, immediately around the perimeter of your house. And this is what we call zone zero or the ember defense zone. And the recommendation, and this is based on scientific research by Dr. Stephen Quarles, when uh, he was originally with the University of California, and then he moved on to work and do research with the Insurance Institute of Business Home and Safety. So this Ember Defense Zone is supported by scientific research. Um, and the recommendation is to use a non-flammable mulch, such as gravel or stone, in that zero to five foot perimeter around your home. And you know, this really, um, it's a, this is a huge shift from what we have historically done around our home perimeters. Um, we've typ typically masked what we call foundation shrubs directly against the home. And uh, from a firewise perspective, um, scientific research absolutely supports um, uh, removing those uh, shrubs from around the home perimeter uh, and creating this ember defense zone. So we're, we're trying to create an environment where uh, when those embers uh, enter into in a fire with the high winds that we have experienced, uh, enter into our home landscape, that they're not landing in a receptive fuel bed that will then transmit the fire uh, into your home. Uh, and it's also, as I mentioned earlier, important to remove and replace any flammable fencing material uh, that is attached to the house in this zero to five foot zone. So uh, as stressed earlier, it is a county code requirement to remove any dead branches and limb up any existing tree limbs. And there is risk associated with having branches over the roof, but the, it is not a county code requirement to remove um, trees um, or tree limbs above the roof. What's more important consideration is the, um, the debris that that tree might drop on your roof. So it's an incredibly important, important maintenance consideration, um, especially during fire season, season to remove that 
any leaf litter deposited um, on your roof or in your gutters. Uh, it is uh, a county code requirement um, to cut tree limbs within 10 feet of a stove pipe or a chimney outlet, and that must be maintained year round. So you know, we have a lot of, um, often get questions from folks around, I have a tree that's within, you know, five to 10 feet of my home, do I need to remove the tree? And we wanna stress that uh, it is not a county code requirement to remove those trees. You would absolutely wanna keep those uh, limbed up to at least six feet from a fire perspective. If they are creating a maintenance issue over your, uh, your roof, um, you might wanna consider pruning back some of those limbs to reduce that maintenance impact. To absolutely be maintaining that roof litter is very critical during fire season off of your roof and out of your gutters. Uh, and then again, um, focusing on the code requirement to remove any tree limbs within 10 feet of a stovepipe or a chimney outlet. So uh, from a maintenance perspective, um, there are a number of county code requirements that do impact um, the zero to five foot ember defense zone. Uh, that cl uh, includes cleaning up and disposing of leaves, pine needles and other plant litter. Um, for example, in our last red flag warning, uh, uh, I was out removing all leaves within that zero to five foot perimeter around my home. So that's a very important consideration, uh, especially with the immediate uh, and imminent threat of fire during a red flag warning day. You wanna um, uh, continually remove that debris from your roof and gutters. And climbing vines um, must be free of dead or dying material. And this applies in the zero to 30 foot zone from a county code requirement. Um, but of course, zero to five falls within that zero to 30 foot zone. Or you, uh, the suggestion is to remove them from any trees or structures. Okay, so let's move into uh, zone one, which is the five to 30 foot home defensive zone home defense zone, also known as the lean, clean, and green zone. So the recommendation in the five to 30 foot zone is to plant in islands separated by hardscape um, to mostly uh, focus on use of low ground covers such as mown native grass, herbaceous perennials, and succulents are optimal selections in this zone. And this is a really great zone for hardscape elements, such as a pool, brick patio, or paving stones. Uh, you can incorporate it, got dry creek bed or boulders. April's got some great pictures in her segment of the presentation that show um, some excellent um, hardscape elements for uh, incorporation into the five to 30 foot uh, home defense zone. So the objective is to um, uh, keep a uh, potential receptive fuel bed in this immediate perimeter of your home low to the ground, right? So you're trying to reduce the risk of that fire transmitting through this zone um, to your home. Uh, and it's also very important to consider um, access in this zone for firefighters because it's very likely that this is where they're um, going to be trying to, uh, if they're having to fight to defend your home, that this is where they're gonna be trying to hold the fire off. Okay, so um, shrubs or trees or small shrub or tree groupings can be used in this, um, in this five to 30 foot home defense zone. Uh, if they're, you're particularly focused on um, keeping them well pruned, properly irrigated and horizontally separated from other plant groupings as, as we talked about in the earlier slides. Um, you, of course, you wanna be watering your plants to maintain their health and regularly maintain them to remove any dead or dry material. And it is a county code requirement to move wood piles to 30 foot feet from buildings or cover them with fire resistant tarps. Uh, and then of course, clear any surrounding vegetation from around um, that wood pile. There's a really compelling video from, uh, I believe it was the Kincaid fire when the firefighters were trying to hold the line to keep um, the fire from moving into the community of Windsor. Uh, and you can uh, see where the firefighters had um, had to take their time uh, while battling the fire to um, take firewood that was stacked up directly next to a front door and toss it out into the lawn um, to get it away from uh, directly up against the house in that zero to five foot zone. So the last thing you wanna be doing is having the firefighters take time to do anything but fight the fire, um, um, to have to be doing preparation work um, 
that we should have done ourselves um, before, uh, especially during fire season and especially during a red flag warning. Um, so I want to stress that um, that the five to 30 foot home defense zone, um, uh, you might want to think about using specimen or individual shrubs or trees, um, really trying to um, keep, uh, keep the fuel uh, load reduced in this zone in direct proximity to your home. Okay, so now we're going to move out to zone two, which is the 30 to 100 foot zone around the perimeter of your home. Uh, and that's called the reduced fuel zone. So we really have the same basic principles here as we did in zone one, but you can include larger shrubs and tree groupings in widely spaced groups, right? So you're separating up um, areas that break up the possible spread of wildfire. You wanna ensure that you have access for maintenance and of course, continue to be vigilant about removing ladder fuels. So uh, since maintenance is a really critical component, um, you wanna make sure you have nice wide walkways that can help both separate those planting areas, create those islands of plantings that we talked about, and also help uh, simplify access, uh, simplify maintenance by giving you improved access. Optimally, you wanna think about using gravel, brick, decomposed granite, or perhaps an irrigated native mown grass strip um, but wood mulch is okay in this zone. And it is a county code requirement that you keep annual grasses mown to a maximum height of four inches. So it's also important to remove any invasive plants, um, which can also spread to neighboring properties. Um, this picture is showing uh, some uh, scotch broom. Uh, which is uh, we're all I'm sure very familiar with, especially anyone who's uh, on Fitch Mountain, there's lots of room on Fitch Mountain. Uh, so it's important to have um, uh, programs to remove invasive plants uh, to help reduce food, fuel load and help reduce spread to neighboring properties. Um, so it's also incredibly important to work with your neighbors to develop a plan. So um, for all of you who are members of COPE groups on this, on this Zoom today, um, you're already doing that work, which is great. Um, it, your zero to 100 foot zone might fall within a neighbor's property. So it's incredibly important that we're working together um, to help reduce our fire risk. So some of the considerations in working with your neighbors, of course, you wanna start with your house, right? Do your home hardening work and the work uh, in your defensible space zones, and then talk to your neighbors, work together to develop a fuel reduction plan for the entire neighborhood. Watch for maintenance needed, uh, whether there's debris accumulating on a neighbor's roof or an uncovered wood pile or unmown tall weeds. And it's also important to think about what the total volume of vegetation is in your area and if there are any ladder fuels that need to be addressed. Other neighborhood considerations, uh, consider designing a common space between homes to minimize fire risk that's comprised of low ground covers or rock mulches with some widely spaced trees and shrubs. Create habitat connectivity to support wildlife. Um, April's gonna have some great plant recommendation suggestions for you in her section of the presentation. And of course, to work with your local fire department, fire safe council or firewise community, we're so lucky to have um, two of our wonderful firefighting professionals here on the Zoom call with us today. Uh, Linda Collister from Hillsburg Fire Department and Chief Turbeville and a great um, representation of their availability and desire to work with us um, to be better prepared. And I, I know they're both closely engaged with, uh, with the, the COPE groups. So you also wanna consider um, uh, the access to your home or property and ensure that you're maintaining vegetation on both sides of roads and driveway. Uh, 10 feet from the road edge and then 15 feet vertically. Optimally maintaining a 12 foot wide uh, unobstructed pavement for the passage of vehicles. Um, so in this um, picture depicted, uh, certainly we would wanna mow those grasses to a height of four inches and uh, limb up any trees uh, six feet from the ground uh, and ensure that there's clear access um, for a fire truck to gain access to your property. 
Okay, so I know many of you likely live in more densely forested areas and um, uh, really the scope of our presentation is within the zero to 100 foot zone um, perimeter around your home. Um, I did share contact information of a colleague of mine here at Cooperative Extension, um, Mike Jones, who is a forestry advisor. Um, to um, for I shared that information with Priscilla to look at scheduling a presentation um, for the Northern Sonoma County co-groups um, on more forest management practices. Um, but very generally in more densely forested areas, you wanna control fire behavior by reducing ladder fuels, opening up the canopy of the trees, uh, and then maintaining those ground fuels on an ongoing basis. And that will both help facilitate fire suppression and help with uh, uh, ground and air attack in the event of a wildfire. Okay, mulch. Um, there is a, a scientific uh, study. This is based on scientific research uh, conducted by the University of Nevada at Reno and the University of California on um, uh, which mulches are more likely to burn. Mulch is a really important uh, consideration and characteristic of a sustainable landscape. Uh, is it conserves moisture, but it is uh, a fuel and as such, it will burn. Um, the scientific research indicates that compost and large sized composted arbor mulch are our best options. Um, you absolutely do not want to use gorilla hair or shredded bark mulch. It's extremely susceptible to ignition from embers. Again, you want to maintain um, an ember defense zone in that zero to five foot perimeter around your home. So no organic mulch within that zero to five foot perimeter. Um, and where you can, you want to separate mulched areas with non-combustible materials. So ideally, if, you've, um, if you follow the practice of planting in islands, uh, you can mulch those islands, but perhaps you're separating uh, those islands of mulch plantings with um, a flagstone walkway or gravel um, or a, a mown native grass strip. Uh, and this picture on the upper right is a perfect example of what not to do. Um, uh, that's uh, gorilla hair and it's a, a broad base of gorilla hair. Uh, and it's, it's right up uh, next to um, uh, uh, juniper hedges, uh, which are uh, probably unirrigated and unmaintained uh, and lead in a path directly to the home. Um, so uh, that's an example of wh what not to do. Okay, and as I've stressed through uh, the presentation, much of our success depends on our ongoing maintenance. Uh, again, you wanna remove, and it is a county code requirement to remove any dead plants and dead branches from trees and shrubs, and to remove vines from trees and shrubs, right? You're wanting to reduce the risk of that fire transmitting up uh, from the ground plane. Um, annually before fire season, you want to mow your annual grasses and weeds to four inches tall or less. You want to cut back your woody perennials and shrubs. Thin any overgrown vegetation. And you really, it's incredibly important to consider the timing of your plant removals and cutbacks based on wildlife cycles, right? So you want to make sure you're not doing cutbacks of trees and shrubs during, for example, bird nesting season. Uh, you want to reuse on-site materials when possible, so you want to keep any chipped wood on-site to compost it for use as mulch. And again, you want to make sure that you've, if you've brought your wood pile in closer to your home um, during uh, the winter, you want to make sure you've moved that wood pile back out 30 feet plus from your building, cover it with a fire-resistant tarp, and uh, clear any surrounding vegetation. And again, that is a, a Sonoma County Code requirement. Every few years as needed, you wanna make sure you're thinning and reducing your tree canopies to remove any twiggy growth, uh, to maintain some separation between the trees and to reduce overall fuel load. Again, you wanna keep lowest branches of trees pruned up. You wanna make sure you're watching that uh, to keep them pruned up six feet from the ground. Cut back ground covers and vines to remove buildup of uh, dry stems and dead leaves and cut back shrubs to renew them. 
Okay, so I know that many of you are most likely not starting from a blank slate. You've got an existing landscape and it can be a little daunting to think about um, what you need to do with an existing landscape um, to make it more um, uh, fire resilient. And this is a great graphic developed by East Bay Mud uh, that shows your before picture. We've got the classic example of foundation shrubs massed up against the house. We've got a tree in close proximity to the chimney uh, and overhanging the roof, likely depositing um, debris that needs to be regularly removed from the roof. Uh, you've got tree branches uh, that are not limbed up to six feet that are uh, growing down to the shrubs and um, continuous masses of shrubs. And here's the recommended after depiction of that same landscape. We've now got islands of vegetation, right? You've got distinct groups of shrubs um, that are separated. The uh, tree has been, uh, the ladder fuel has been removed. It's been limbed up six feet. Uh, the tree limbs have been moved, removed within six feet of the chimney or stovepipe and those foundation shrubs directly up against the house in that zero to five foot ember defense zone have been removed. Another great graphic depiction from East Bay Mud uh, showing tree maintenance, um, uh, depicting thinning of the canopy, um, mowing of the grasses and weeds, of course, underneath the tree um, to four inches. Uh, and then uh, in this case, East Bay Mud suggesting trimming up uh, tree limbs from the surface plane, six to 10 feet. Um, uh, uh, general recommendation is six, uh, but if it's appropriate with the tree, uh, you know, you could limit up higher as well. So it's kind of a rapid fire of a lot of information um, and just wanted to do a quick recap for you. So in the zero to 100 foot zone, um, within the zero to five foot zone from the house, you want to use inorganic materials such as gravel or stepping stones. And of course, remove or replace any flammable fencing materials that are attached to the house. In the five to 30 foot zone from the house, you want to plant in islands separated by hardscape. Once again, that's a really excellent place for consideration of use of hardscape, um, making sure you've got appropriate access for firefighters and to select plant materials um, that are low to the ground, such as low herbaceous perennials, grasses, or succulents, and consider use of individual or specimen shrubs or trees. And then in the 30 to 100 foot zone from the house, same basic principles as the five to 30 foot zone, but um, you can include shrub and tree groupings in widely spaced groups, separated by areas that break up the spread of wildfire. So some of the key takeaways that I hope you'll, um, you'll come away from this presentation with is uh, consider a selection of fire resistant uh, plant, that fire resistant landscape materials, um, arranging your landscape plants with spacing to disrupt a fire. Of course, optimally selecting native plants to support biodiversity, which um, April's gonna take you some great examples and suggestions in that regard. To maintain your landscape features, keeping those plants well irrigated, healthy, and well pruned. Uh, remove any dead or dying shrubs, trees, or branches. Avoid, uh, of course, planting close to structures, especially near vents, under windows, or exposed eaves. And to prune tree limbs up at least six feet, or one third of tree height from the ground or understory um, uh, plants. So we truly believe that a firewise and sustainable landscape is possible that incorporates beauty, safety, and privacy saves water and supports life, uh, wildlife. But plant placement and design are key. Maintenance, ongoing maintenance um, of those plant materials is essential. Uh, start at the house and work out. And if you can implement a zero to five foot non-combustible zone. Uh, and we have some wonderful resources, which I'm sure Cleo can help share in the chat box from the University of California on home hardening on landscaping considerations and the compulsive combustibility of landscape mulches. So with that, that is the end of my presentation. Sorry for the glitches on the presentation format. Uh, and I think April, do you wanna open it up to a couple of questions before we move into your presentation? Yeah, I think that'd be nice for people to stand up. And I'm gonna stand up for my presentation. Sounds good. 
great, great amount of information from both you and Ellie. Um, Cleo, I don't know how you want to do the questions. Um, I don't have any questions. No. So uh, if people want to raise a, if they, if you want to put a question in the chat box. Uh, people have been putting where they're from, and we have people from Fitch Mountain, from I saw Windsor. Uh, so Windsor, let me see more Fitch Mountain, uh, Cloverdale, Windsor, Southwest Santa Rosa, Fitch Mountain. I think I got all the people who put in there. Any people not represented in what? Uh, the areas that I said, put your where you're from on the chat box. That would be great. April, do you want to expand your presentation to the full screen size? Or does it not show full screen? It's it's the lower right. There it is. Oh, it's the the lower right third from the left third from the right. Yeah, third from the right, you, that big, that box all the way over. That's, that's oh, right. Yeah. Did that do it? Did One more did? time. There we okay. go. Yay. Better luck than mine. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, uh, Mill Creek Walbridge, a fire victim is here. Oh. Uh, a Big Ridge Road, Dry Creek Valley. Uh, I'm just reading up more Dry Creek Valley. Val, uh, no. Uh, yeah, and so um, uh, Priscilla added a, a chat comment. Can you talk about ivy? It grows everywhere on Fitch Mountain and up tree. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you really want to think about um, what kind of uh, you kind of start looking at your landscape differently when you get deeply enmeshed in this content, and you really need to think about whether you're creating a receptive fuel bed and. Uh, I, the biggest issue with the ivy, I would say, would be you, I would keep it, you want to make sure you're keeping it from growing up trees um, and, uh, and on the home. Um, and the problem is, is that it, you, it can create a, a easy receptacle for a lot of dead debris. Um, and that creates a receptive, a much more receptive fuel bed. So, um, uh, it's extremely difficult to get rid of. It's, it is, um, English ivy is on um, the California invasive plants list. Um, um, so, I mean, you really need to think about reducing the risk, for example, of it transmitting fire up to trees and on fences. I would say that would be um, uh, critical priorities I would consider on uh, if, if you have a large uh, infestation of English ivy in your environment. Um, uh, and absolutely keeping it um, uh, out of that zero to five foot zone and away from climbing up the house. I don't know if um, Marshall or Linda would have anything else that they would suggest around ivy and ivy maintenance from your experiences. This is Marshall and I, I completely agree with your assessment. It's as far as landscaping goes, you know, it's a lot of it's the maintenance and how it grows and becomes more stocky and then what it then does collect, you know? And so that's the issue with cypresses other than they are volatile as well. And so it's the upkeep maintenance. And um, a lot of my experiences are from my observations, not necessarily in, you know, modeled or in science. And I have, believe it or not, seen ivy burn. I mean, I've seen actually seen ice plant burn, believe it or not, but yeah. it's just that it's because that dead material is dried out by these warm, dry summers, you get some wind. And so it's all about reducing your fireproofness as close as you can get to 0%, just knowing you're never gonna get totally 0% or 100% fireproof, so. Yeah. And then I also see a question from Austin, a fire safe mulch or mulch alternative for steep slopes. Uh, but by the way, Mimi, back, before we move off of the ivy, can I speak yes, to that for a minute? Yep. Um, I had I had about a quarter acre of ivy and uh, and periwinkle, which are both non-native and invasive plants, on a property right next to the creek bank, and the ivy was growing up the trees, and the vinca was growing down the bank as long as well as the ivy, 
And um, I had to go through a pretty elaborate process of dealing with it along the creeks because uh, I think as Priscilla said in an earlier email, it does actually, it, it can at least appear to uh, provide erosion control, but you basically don't wanna do anything on the creek bank without getting, I would go to the Resource Conservation District or possibly the Sonoma Ecology Center for guidance because you want professional guidance before you do anything in creeks. Uh -huh. But um, if you're working with trees, you can, you know, you don't want it to climb the trees and you can actually just cut it at the base of the tree, try not to damage the trunk of the tree, and then it'll it'll die going up the tree, but then you have really dead stuff. So you actually do have to, you know, work with your ladders and, and so on and, and just pull it off the trees. Uh -huh. but if you don't do it, then you'll have a, an even worse problem because um, the tree will die because the ivy will rob it of its ability to in some cases photosynthesize through the trunk, but also various other, it basically chokes it out. Yeah. So uh, yeah, ivy is a problem. Um, and if there are any more questions about it, I, I would, I mean, there are some basics um, and there, you know, more detail later if people are interested. The question is that people are using it for erosion control. Is there a suggestion for something else to replace it? It depends on, on the slope and, and, the, and what's going on above. Um, ivy often tends to grow in shaded environments. And um, so I, I have done very large scale invasive plant removals and revegetation um, under the purview of the of fish and game along rivers and streams. So I'm pretty familiar with approaches to that. So one thing I recommend is that you do it in, in sections because it does provide some cover and food for wildlife. So you wouldn't do it all at once and you need to replant. It also provides, it can provide erosion control. So you would, you would wanna do maybe a quarter of it every year and then you would replant with whatever the native species would be that would be in that area. And then, and if it's within the defensible space zone, of course you wanna create the islands and have uh, if for when you revegetate. I, I think Mimi mentioned, and I can talk about this later, I don't want to go into too much detail, but Mimi mentioned arbor mulch as a, as a good solution as long as you're more than five feet away from the home. Mm -hmm. And that can do a, a really great job of erosion control. But erosion control is another subject that is very complex and depends on many things. The resource conservation districts are really good with uh, recommendations on erosion control. Um, yeah, and, and there's some great native plant options for erosion control yeah. that have deep rooting um, characteristics and um, there's some excellent ceanothus ground covers that um, can be good for erosion control. Um, uh, I, I mean, the, April might have some other ideas or recommendations, yeah. but there are some, some great native options for considering for I'll erosion. I'll talk about that some in my, I put some, some slides then around that, um, that, sounds that great. question as well. Yeah. Mimi, um, can you finish the question on the mulch to, or, yeah. or the steep slopes? Yeah, so that's a tough one uh, because classically gorilla mulch um, has been used on steeper slopes because it sticks a little better, but it is highly flammable. I mean, it's, I think that's like the optimal receptive fuel bed for embers coming in and, and would transmit the fire to your home. Um, uh, the arbor mulch really holds well on a hillside. Yeah. It really does. So if I optimally, I would say um, plant materials as a mulch. I mean, uh, practically, if you can get plant cover, I mean, that creates a, a form of, you know, natural plant. It's shading the ground plane. Um, uh, if you can get some, um, uh, some native plants established as, you know, that are ground covers, do some mulching to help support their development and growth. Um, but if you have it like a, a vast unplanted area, you, arbor mulch is a well composted arbor mulch is, is probably your best bet. Um, arbor mulch, you can buy that from pretty much any landscape material. SBI has it, Grab and Grow has it. Um, SBI is up in, is in Windsor. So it's one of the, you know, for the folks on this program. I wanted to mention that um, I used to work for the Napa County Resource Conservation District and and one thing that um, I, the, I've had experience with is it, it, and the knowledge that when people talk about erosion control they could be talking about something as small as a you know a patch of 
whatever that they've removed, maybe 40 by 40, or if it's something much bigger that has an upslope source of water, say from a downspout or from a road or, uh, or if the soil is unstable, then you know, you're talking about something a little bit more substantial um, than uh, some mulch. Uh, so you may need to do some contouring of the slope. Um, so that's what, so take what we say with a grain of salt and, and understand that each situation is a little bit different. Um, the main problem when you remove vegetation is that when water hits it, it, it creates splash, which then gets the, the soil particles moving and then they can move down the landscape and gradually start to create rills and then deeper gullies. And um, so, so the first thing you wanna do is get some cover over it, even something like rice straw, which doesn't have any weed seeds in it. Um, during the rainy season, you don't have to worry about flammability. Once it gets wet, it, it'll actually stay on the ground. That's a problem that it might blow away. So you can see there, um, there are lots of factors to the question of what to do for erosion. Okay, I think I should probably get started. Um, we'll take some more questions at the end if anybody has questions at that point. Um, let's see. My name is April Owens, as I've been introduced, and I have a lot of hats that I wear. Um, one of them is the executive director of the Habitat Corridor Project that I'm a co-founder of. And we started about, now it's been about seven years. Um, I, I had gotten my, um, my MBA at, in sustainable business at Dominican College. And I was one of the only people in my cohort that actually took their final project and decided to go roll with it. And so what it was is a for-profit and non-profit blend. So the Habitat Corridor Project um, is fed financially in a large part by my private landscape design business that I'm um, called April Owens Design. I also, so I have a background in landscape design and landscape architecture training. Mm -hmm. um, I've been doing this for about 20 years now and um, got obsessed with native plants via the Native Plant Society. Um, which is a wonderful place to start for any of you all just not knowing what plants to use in your area, um, getting involved in our local chapter. Um, the local Sonoma County one is Milo Baker and there's a, there's, there's a northern chapters, there's a coastal chapter. So there's a lot of chapters if you go on the website, um, cmps.org. And then we, have, we have lectures and it's just a great resource for, for diving in and, and becoming a native plant donkey like me. Um, so our mission with the Habitat Corridor Project is to create and promote California native plant restoration gardens in the urban environment. So we do that by um, creating demonstration gardens. We have a corridor in Sebastopol um, we uh, with a few gardens. Um, we have a, a project called the Living Learning Landscapes at the, next to the junior college um, that's being installed right now with the Master Gardeners and um, CMPS and, and the Corridor Project. I'll talk a little bit about, so it's, if you go on our website, it's just nice. I always believe that just to love these plants, you need to see them um, designed well in a, in a well-designed environment. And so I'm trying to, to promote um, beautiful native plant gardens that can be um, accessible to all of you for free. Um, so we're, we came together as we've been talking um, from, from Ellie, kind of pulled us all together and from all this dialogue, we, we realized that from fire and water, you know, drought, you know, for a long time, it was just drought, 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 you know, everything was like water, water, water. And so we were, you know, putting in drip irrigation and trying to, you know, have these zero escapes. And then we started having fires in Sonoma County, and then it was just fire, fire, fire. And, um, and then in the background, a lot of us ecologists and um, we're always, concerned about biodiversity with the amount of growth that's happened in California. So since I became a landscape architect, uh, that was in the boom time of developments in the Central Valley and, and I, I was trained in Santa Cruz. Um, so we just saw so many like these large development going in and there went all the plants and in came all these just boring little gardens, you know, the same little cookie cutter one after the other, the other people got really dependent on these plants that they love and they're beautiful plants, but there's just this amazing array of beautiful plant material from California that like Ellie said, has evolved with our pollinators and our bird friends and our quail and our 
can't, you know, everybody that they evolve together. And so they, they would prefer, um, and there's been studies by Tal Talamy and a lot of others that, that the amount of food that is in native plants versus like pollen and, and, um, and all that, um, is a lot, is a lot, a lot more in, um, native plants and birds use native plant seeds a lot more. Um, so back, you know, talking about resilient landscapes, and I know that you know, some of our some of our talks are are going to repeat themselves. So I'm mostly here to show you some beautiful pictures, give you some examples, and kind of point you in the right direction. So um, I have some tips on these slides that I added for the last one. So I learned about native plants by taking a hike um, and, and following botanists and through the Native Plant Society, going on their their um, outdoor uh, field trips. And right now, of course, with COVID, we're not doing those, but as soon as we can get this under control, um, that's a really great place to start in your area. I'm sure there's a lot of wonderful hikes up in North, in North Sonoma County. Um, so getting to know, when I first started designing, I would, you know, when I'd come, I'd go to a, a client's house and in like 10 minutes before I'd drive around the neighborhood or take a little walk and kind of see if there's any native plants that are just peeking out, like, like Ellie said about like the, the oaks, the California um, live oaks, or you'll see like a couple coffee berries or maybe a toy on. So the, the deal with biodiversity, it, that is the redundancy. So if one species struggles or fails, its function within the ecosystem, for example, to provide a certain food, nutrients, a specific type of shelter, or an essential chemical interaction, it may be performed by one or more other species. So it's really important to have, you know, masses of these plants, but but coming, but having a variety of them, and not just depending on just one plant in the landscape. Like turf, you know, that was the typical um, that the sign of of you know your home ownership, and um, was to have your pretty beautiful lawn with no no habitat whatsoever. So sustainability um, is really to me, it's just looking out for our future generations, and so making sure that we're not using more than, you know, we're, we're creating more for future generations rather than depleting um, the, all the resources now. Um, as Mimi was talking about sustainability in a landscape, in the gardens that we use, resilient landscapes, um, is thinking about design, thinking about how big the plant's gonna be so that you don't end up having to do so much maintenance, you know, in, before fire season. So you have cover, and so you're thinking about all these different pieces. Where can the water sink in on your site? Um, where are good places for mounds? So um, just backing up and really thinking about what you've got in your landscape. And oftentimes I will, you know, the client or you all know your landscape so much better than we do just by coming for a couple of seasons. So I love when, when people tell me, oh, there's this warm little patch over here and this is where the water kind of, you know, cools. And so it really, really paying attention and backing up and paying attention to your site before you start um, any of this work. So I'm going to talk about the different zones um, and back up what Mimi was talking about. Um, in the zero to five, we're talking about decorative rock. We're talking about um, no mofet, like to keeping, you know, if you're going to have plant material in that zero to five, you're going to have it very well hydrated. Um, I typically, I, I've been using this no mow fescue in some parts of around homes um, so that you don't end up with just the pebble all the way around the house in the zero to five, as long as it's well maintained and well hydrated. Um, the native mixes of no mow fescue turf, um, there's a bent grass mix now that is, is I am finding it's really performing well in the heat and, and the hotter spaces. This no mow um, really, um, doesn't want, like, I, I was trying to think when I was preparing for this talk today, you know, you guys are up in Windsor and North County, it's really hot. And so you're going to definitely use this, this product in a shady um, part of your landscape. Another tip, um, you know, take a field trip to your local materials yard, like Ellie was mentioning, SBI for, for North County, and just wander around and look at all the, all the different things that you can use in your landscape. There's tons of different kinds of pebble. So you don't have to have just like the old fashioned lava rock landscape that we're trying to get you away from. Um, there's a lot of beautiful materials to be used. Um, so we, we talk about what, what else can go in this zero to five. And um, we just, I just wanted to share this wonderful habitat fountain that I created. And um, if you look really closely on the picture on the left, there's a, um, 
there's a little tiny lizard getting this little drop that came off from these, these crevices that, that create all this different habitat in this one boulder. So it's like, it's also thinking about um, when we were creating this boulder, uh, this fountain, I was thinking, you know, it's not just plants because we're trying to think, oh, well, what, what are the butterflies going to want? And what are the birds going to want? But it's like just watching the, this, the use on this fountain, um, you know, the basin needs to be kind of shallow so the birds feel comfortable. At first we had it really spouting like very strongly. None of the birds would even come near it. And then we, we adjusted it and turned it down. And um, it's just a wonderful, and the client is just so excited to watch it, you know, and, and the different kinds of birds that come. and. And like I said, this little lizard friend that came to visit it. And that was the first day we had even turned it on. So it was amazing how fast that that, um, that the habitat was created and how thirsty everybody is. This was up in, I do a lot of work in the Bennett Ridge area um, uh, rebuild um, from the fires. And so um, yeah, the deer are hungry, the lizards are thirsty. Um, in the zero to five, um, you know, I, I, since I, I, and Ellie said too, um, I, typically do 100% California native, that, um, but we will do 80% if, um, uh, you know, up, up to, you know, 80% 80, 80 and then 20% of people's favorite things like lavenders and fruit trees and things like that. But a nice way to use your non-natives in your landscape is to create containers with that nice color with annuals so that you, you get to see them close up to your home. Um, and, uh, but but if there, but in the landscape you're really offering that biodiversity by using native plants. And this is that native bent grass. This had just gone in. We typically this is not like our you know we're not like water over users. Um, and we were just watering it in to get it in. But, but this was the native, the bent grass native fescue, um, and then some irrigation that we've been tending to use called MP rotators, which give a low um, a low evapotranspiration rate. Um, but an overhead spray um, that you can use wisely with your timer to give the plants a good soak overhead. But um, oh, heck, and also, I can't see it. Oh, I wouldn't. Mute people. Um, another example are some steps that these actually survived the 2017 fires um, and uh, had some burn, we replaced some of them. But, you know, as long as you have some pebble in between and, um, you know, it's, of erosion and hill, hilly sites, I find it kind of challenging to figure out what materials to use for steps um, where, so these obviously will burn, but we have the, the pebble in between them. And we've just started using steel edging as steps as well in the, in the, the zero to 30 pretty much. Um, and this is another shot of a, a garden that um, Mimi had in hers, but um, using the pebble and, um, <coughs> And hardscape around the landscape, and then and then heading into your your masses of plants and islands. So you can think of islands in you know in these longer strips as well. They don't just have to be um, around island shapes. And so this house we was from this was burned in the 2017 Tubbs fire. And while they were rebuilding, we were planting natives so that when they got back in their home, they had you know a lot of of um, of plant resources and bigger plants to, for habitat. And so that's something to think of well, as you're rebuilding, um, thinking of ways, places outside of the construction zone that you can start getting back some of the plants that the, that your burnt area really needs for habitat. Um, this is a kind of a fun modern landscape um, by my friend at Native Valley Design. And um, she used this plant, um, another turf product um, called uh, Lipia. Um, or Coropia is a new um, version of it that doesn't spread into the wildlands. So you just have to be careful with, uh, uh, back again to, to ivy and vinca. I mean, that's why we, another reason we really promote natives is because if they go wild and get out and about, at least they're providing habitat and they are, they're part of, you know, they've adapted here versus plants. Like, you know, I'm sure that everybody thought ivy would be the right choice. It's great for erosion, you know, it, it can't kill it and you know and then it ends up being a big big, big problem. This is another non-native plant that we can use around your um, flagstones. It's hard to find a plant that um, is low enough and doesn't use much water and this is actually a plant that that dogs can walk on and it does have some habitat value in the flowers of the daisy like flowers. 
um, in, in this, in these pictures are using some swales. So, so looking at the drainage on site, uh, making sure that you drain away from the house and the water isn't pooling this close to the house. But this is a good maintenance tip as well in one of our gardens because you see the seed heads on this, this is the um, Pasuka rubra, the red fescue. So in, before fire season, I would clean this up and cut the, cut the heads all off and make sure that you're, that's well hydrated up against the house there. Um, and this is a swale path. So it, swales don't have to be completely obvious. They can actually you know, be under like, a, it's like, almost like a French drain and then you can walk on top of it to get the water away from the house in this, in this instance, or sometimes you do want to sink it in. Um, and then on the right here is another nice maintenance example that we went back in. This, this, this swale had gone in before um, we were really in this group and talking about resilient landscapes and fire. And so we went back in and, and added more pebble along the base of the house, um, took out the mulch that was there and remove some of the shrubs that are on the left side of the, um, the swale so that it, it is even more, more resilient and serves as a, as a nice fire break in that or a um, defensible zone. Trees um, are, and this is all oftentimes when I ask the, the um, fire officials that we have on board because this, this house actually survived the Kincaid fire and it was, I, you know, and only because we had gone in and they had had an arborist really lift the, these, this giant, these giant oaks um, limbs up 10 feet above their house. They had mowed very well and um, cleaned up the leaf litter to two inches, but hydrated it very well before that fire and during that fire. And the client actually watched the fire come up to where the two inches of, of oak leaf litter were left. and fizzle out. So um, they were lucky enough to have that opportunity to, to really hydrate the landscape before the fire. But I really recommend people on red flag days to make sure that you hydrate your mulch, even, even if you're following all of these guidelines. It's really important to think ahead and, and um, make sure everything's really well hydrated before um, you have to evacuate and, and you're run, running around frantically watering and packing up your car, which a lot of us had to do. Um, but big trees, um, and we don't want to just take them out. Um, and often, a lot of us live under big trees. I'm sure a lot of you live in um, Douglas fir forests. And so it's about um, moderating what your safety risk. And um, I know the fire officials always say that the, that the trees are, can stay. You just have to be careful about maintenance and um, the leaf litter on your home during fire season. So there's this high energy maintenance time that goes in when it gets dry and, um, and hot here in the county, unfortunately. But also the, the whole idea of energy savings with the trees. And so it's back to that systemic thinking. It's not just fire. It's like it's you're cooling your house and you, you guys all have like 110 degree days up there. Um, so really thinking about weighing, weighing um, your landscape. Into five to 30. We're looking at low growing plants and masses of plants, um, islands, I call them biodiversity islands with pathways in between as a break between the, the fuel. So you're really thinking about slowing fire down as it comes into your landscape is how I, I, I think about it now after we've been working on the fire with fire officials. So you're, you're working from the house out to be safe when you're kind of doing a new, uh, when, you're main, when you're retrofitting a, an existing landscape. But when you're designing, I think of like how a fire would come up and start and come towards the house. So you're slowing fire down as it comes through the landscape if that if that happens. Um, these are all these are native buckwheats and monkey flowers. So this garden, you know, it was about to get a big haircut, um, but like before fire in the maintenance time of the summer um, or in the winter, actually, like Ellie was saying, we cut back the, the grasses in the background there and but you know, do like a third every couple of years. We take take about a third of the plant material back if it's getting too big. And the winter time again, it's it's a good time because we've had rain. And so if you if you do all this in the summer, it's so hot the plants oftentimes will die. They just go into shock. So thinking about doing this kind of the big landscape work when we have our rains is really important. 
um, other ways to think like this is kind of this is a residential um, in a or urban space that's kind of challenging um, thinking about these these um, elements in your landscape when you're when you're really your whole garden is 20 feet you know so um, thinking about outside of your home and and um, this I, I, I like this example of of islands this is our demonstration garden along highway 12 I mean, along the basketball um, in front of a housing community and so they chose to um, have the habitat corridor project to a biodiversity April your corridor. voice your voice is getting really quiet April oh, okay thank you um yeah I was gonna try to I'll, I'll, I'll speak to this better so um back to that one is that better um, I uh, so you can visit these plants and um, and see and see kind of where how you how you fit into your neighborhood and then, and then another idea for this zone is thinking about driveways um, pathways and auto courts so um, often time you know and, and they don't have to be ugly you know we can use this Trinity pebble with a few juncus in it um, this crushed crushed shale as a as a really inexpensive driveway material that's permeable. So you're also getting the water to sink in instead of having a concrete um, auto court or driveway. Oh shoot, it's 11.5. I, this always happens to me. Um, so those, think of those pathways. Again, this is you know using thinking of masses of plants and the space in between them can be beautiful too. Um, rock walls can stop fire as well and create that that um, definition. More swales. Um, I use swales a ton. I love to keep water on site if possible. This giant swale of all these boulders was um, in. This was just a big flat lawn, and they were having this soggy issue. Um, and you know, it was just always like this big messy. And so we put in the swale, and now they can enjoy the water um, because it turns into a rain garden instead of just the big soggy lawn. 30 to 100, like Mimi said, is not there, there's not a huge difference. And in both in both of these zones, you can have some larger shrubs in the islands. So in so in five to 30, you're gonna you're gonna have maybe a couple of you can have like one coffee berry in there amongst a lot of lower plants. In the 30 to 100, you have this opportunity to have these larger islands with masses of shrubs, which the key to a habitat garden and 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 creating biodiversity in your landscape is to have the food for the birds and the cover and so larger larger um, masses of shrubs is really important if you're going to create a habitat garden and really be enhancing um, that in your landscape i just wanted to show like a, this is a um, buckwheat but that that we planted it last year and in a year it just filled in so beautifully um, and created this this giant so these masses of plants really create a, a an amazing habitat value and it's just covered with pollinators in the warm on the warm days. Um, another like I was said you thinking like looking at your landscape from the outside in is another really good way to approach maintenance and approach um, resilient landscapes and so here these are these are masses of plants separated by rock walls and height and then going up through the landscape to a swale with deer grass um, up at the top. So um, it's just a beautiful example of, of, of ways you can have a resilient landscape that's gorgeous and full of, full of biodiversity. Um, as we talked about before, what to use between the masses of plants, um, you know, two inches of let or less of arbor mulch, gravel, and this, you know, and, um, and mowed California native bunch grasses are really a really good use, good, good um, things to do in this 30 to 100. In fact, you know, again, in the, in the five to 30, you're gonna really reduce your use of arbor mulch except for around the plants and try to make sure your spacing between plants are, are more hardscapey gravel or, or um, mowed grasses or, but in, in this, in the bottom picture is a low um, evergreen uh, coyote brush, a ground cover. Um, so again, with maintenance every few years, you're definitely gonna keep, have to keep that maintained in between the masses of, of larger plants. Um, so thinking of soil health, when we think about resiliency, we want to make sure that we're we're saving water, but we're also giving the plants what they need and the water and the soil what it needs. And we're understanding so much more about soil health and how 
how alive soil is. And so you're just, if you're just watering around the plant and you're letting the soil completely dry out in between the plants, your that whole mycorrhizae system underneath the ground is not getting nurtured. So arbor mulch, you know, mulching really helps with keeping the soil hydrated, but also these low water use um, MP rotator um, irrigation systems or drip um, in a grid. Um, so you're hydrating the whole whole ground. And this is our really fun landscape as they were going in at the, at the Santa Rosa JC. And you can find out their addresses at livinglearninglandscapes.com. We have a lot of free um, plans on there of beautifully designed irrigation systems and planting plans and a lot of um, ways to save water on site. So there's, that's a really nice resource, free resource for y'all. Um, so we don't really have time to go through the chatting about why we use California native plants, but as Ellie said, um, you know, it, these are just some comments that I've had in the past. You, you keep your local insects and animal populations thriving, reduce the need for water, bringing in other species potentially spreads exotic diseases, um, beauty, blooming season matches our climate. And I love the sense of, of um, seasonality that you get in the native landscape when I really say, I always say like in August and September when it's super hot and the last thing you wanna do is be out in your garden because it's so, you know, that's when the gardens kind of look, the native gardens kind of brown and kind of restful and it reminds me to be restful as well during those times. Um, so tips for successful habitat planting. Um, you're gonna use many types of flowers, large groupings, we call them pollinator targets flowering at different times, and plants that provide both nectar and pollen sources. This is a lovely little plant, woolly sunflower, that's a wonderful ground cover that just blooms its little heart out all year round, pretty much. Um, and so now for some of the wonderful plants, um, this, so some of the bigger groups of uh, genera of plants that we use a lot, are, and they have a, a ton of habitat value, are sages, salvias. Um, there's larger ones and smaller ones. There's low growing ones like the Sonoma sage is a really wonderful ground cover that on a hot, in a hot slope, um, in a sunny slope you could use as erosion control as long as you, as you make sure they follow the guidelines of doing the masses and then having space between these plants and keeping them well maintained. Um, Mimulus and salvia and solidago are a wonderful combination to use. Um, uh, one tip, you know, is to leave, I know a lot of us are really tidy gardeners and we want everything all cleaned up, but um, it really thinking about the, the seed heads being a, a really a, a valuable food source for the birds, so leaving those on, and that's another kind of fall color interest in the garden as well to me, so I leave the seeds on, heads on until it starts raining. Um, thinking a lot, you remember that when you just go into the nursery and you're, and you're just you know, picking a plant, that you need to read the tag and make sure you know how big it's gonna grow because a lot of these genera will have like buckwheats can have really tall, really giant five foot buckwheats or these wonderful low growing worn or little um, ground cover buckwheats. So just really knowing that, you know, it, California fuchsia can be a big plant or a small plant or a tiny plant or a fire source. So a uh, fiery kind of plant. So you know, that needs a lot of maintenance. So just really knowing your plants and the species and how they grow. Um, coyote brush is a super high habitat value pollinator um, friendly plant that can be really easily maintained and cut back. So a lot of times, like Mimi was saying, there's these fire lit, fire, you know, um, un, you know, bad plant lists or whatever. Sorry, I can't think of the word. Um, and, you know, but Baccarus is one of those plants that you can really cut back and it, it fluffs out beautifully with green foliage that can be a wonderful resource in your garden. Um, and then uh, again with the sages, this is seed bliss, which is a lovely ground covery sage. But when they grow together, oftentimes the plants, you know, um, some of the salvias kind of grow up the baccarus. I love that combination. Um, California native shrubs are super important in your in your garden, your native garden. And that's one of the reasons that at least you know reached out to us and we started talking about this and we started talking to the fire officials, like how can we get habitat and bigger plants in a landscape that's safe and, and um, from, from a fire perspective. Um, right now, the Toyons are gorgeous all over the county and they come, they came back beautifully after the fires um, and can be really cut back. Another plant that can be reinvigorated every couple of years um, to stay the size and, and um, stay more resilient. Coffee berry 
as I as I, uh, my my partners were speaking, I was watching my coffee berries out the windows, and the birds are just loving them right now. So I'm always seeing such a fun. So that's another fun thing about having native plants in your garden is it's it's like this delightful extra level you you asked to come to your garden, and so you get you know us plant nerds are like oh it's so pretty, and then uh, then after I've discovered birds and and butterflies and all these crazy like when this plant is blooming and you look closely on a warm day there are just such a diverse amount of pollinators on it that you know just the, the the hundreds of different kinds of bees that we have i wanted to add a little bit in the shade because i know that some of you all are are in the shade and i and i've been leaning kind of towards with new builds i there's a lot of sun right now so we're waiting on these the trees to grow in to get more shade but this yerba buena satorea is a wonderful plant instead of in a shadier part shade um, instead of ivy on a hillside. It grows really fast. Um, another plant that I would suggest for that would be California fescue. Um, you see that a lot up in up in the northern county um, under oak trees and, and it can be maintained beautifully and has really native native plants have intense giant um, root structure. So the two thirds of the plant is underground. So it's really that's why they're so drought, drought tolerant and they can really um, help help the soil as well. Um, hummingbird sage is another lovely plant for in the shade. And as Ellie talked already about hookara, which we all love, and it just blooms and blooms and is a wonderful shade loving plant. Um, spice bush is a larger shrub that's, I think it's underused and um, very beautiful flowers. And um, it's, it's a larger shrub, but it can be kind of it's very open and, and airy and lovely to use. Um, so speaking of, I'm gonna wrap up here, but um, speaking of biodiversity islands, this is a combination and you guys, you all will get our slides so you can have this, you don't have to write this down, but this is kind of my go-to um, you know, uh, plant combo that really um, gives a lot of bang for your buck. And I think, you know, I, it's just a lovely mix of plants that I don't have time to completely go into, but as we've talked about some of them with the, um, the sages and the monkey flower and the manzanita is something that I hadn't talked about yet. Um, but manzanitas used carefully in your landscape are not, a, it's not a hazard. And they're, they're again, another plant that blooms in the winter and provides a huge amount of food for um, hummingbirds. So talk about fun to see in your garden. And I get back to the sustainability, um, you know, the why we really need to, we, we get so wrapped up in what was going on right this second, like I said, with the drought for five years and fires for the last five years, and then we forget about water again, and people are putting their turf back in. So we really need to think about the future, the resources that we're taking away for our future generations. And I would, my heart would be broken if my son could not enjoy the the, uh, the hummingbirds and the, the pollinators that we're seeing, you know, have such a destructive this development and all this is having such a destructive force on. So thank you all for joining us on a Saturday. Um, here's some of our websites. We, um, as a group, we have SonomaResilientLandscapes.com that's gonna change soon, but right now that's a resource. Um, we'll just have a different um, uh, uh, URL coming soon. Um, and we're working on that website, but at least it has a lot of these resources, a lot of the codes. Um, livinglearninglandscapes.com, um, my website, habitatquarterproject.org, sonomaecologycenter.org has a ton of resources. And we have new, both the Sonoma Ecology Center and the Habitat Quarter Project have a newsletter that comes out perennially, you know, every a couple weeks or so. And then the UC Master Gardeners website is just amazingly full of, of information for you all to follow to keep going with on this. So we've only cracked the surface. <laughs> and that's it. So do we want to take any questions? Yeah, I just wanted to let everybody know that I put a link uh, to a Google Doc that has all the links that we put here so you don't need to fret. Uh, and I shared the, the link in the chat area. So you just need to copy the link. I think with, with so many forested sites that I know that people are coming to this group, I would love if, if one of the fire officials would speak to existing trees around your home and, and forested sites. Um, I think that I, I don't have expertise on that, but I, I know that it's an important issue for this group. This is Marshall again. I can speak Marshall. unless uh, the fire marshal and the college wants to talk. So 
<clears throat> I would say, um, you know, there's, and I'll get into my, my for, I'll talk forestry a little bit. There's two types of trees, the natives and the non-natives. <clears throat> and in general, the redwoods, the coast live oak, coast live oak, even the bay trees, as long as they're, whether they've self pruned and limbed themselves up or you prune them up, the six, the six foot, um, reference provided, I think that's a good good advice or 10 foot on the trunk, it's a good advice to basically keep, um, you know, keep a fire on the surface of the earth so the trees don't torch out. So a single tree, buy a house, I, and I know there's some trees listed on some of these websites like Douglas fir, for example, um, in, you know, may, you know, they can catch, um, but as long as they're separated and they have vertical and horizontal spacing, they're, they're fine to have. Um, and that kind of also go when we start getting outside defensible space, start talking from 500 feet away or, or large land management principles, forestry management, and I'm not a registered professional forester, but that's that spacing is, is key in, in large trees. So if we talk about some of the what I believe are non natives like Italian cypress, uh, palm trees, I, I just my experience with those two trees in particular, I hate to say I'd cut everything down, but palm trees, they can just catch an ember and then all those embers rain down in windy conditions and we can't get our water 100 feet up in the air effectively enough and they're, you know, other than cutting them down, which doesn't help buy a house. So palm trees and the Italian cypress or cypress trees that can, you know, catch an ember because they have a lot of dead thatch inside of them and then they go up really quick, but there's a lot of heat to break windows or get an eave on fire or spread to the adjacent vegetation. So you gotta, gotta kind of look at that. So in general, the deciduous trees like our California blacks are a great example. The trees that lose their leaves every year and get new leaves or just more open and airy and don't have the appearance of being able to catch an ember. Um, I have no problem with those trees, um, even with some density, not great spacing. Um, and the plus they provide shade and moisture in the soil um, are, you know, I, I, are totally fine. So it's kind of a case by case as as much of this stuff but I'm not advocating to, to clear cut around homes either, so. I, I want to, I just want to reinforce what you just said, uh, because those, you know, I did some of those sketches that Mimi showed of, the, the, you, you know, on the, you need 10 feet between trees and as the slope steepens, you need 20 feet. And I, I mean, I know many of us live in landscapes that the, the forest was already there. And I also know of people who think they have to go and cut the trees out so they have spacing you know, they're native trees, so they have spacing between the canopies, and it just breaks my heart every time we sh show that slide, you know, because I drew it, <laughs> and I know that, that that's not what we're asking people to do, um, and as you said, Marshall, so thank you so much for saying that. As long as you don't have ladder fuels going up into those trees, it's not as big a deal uh, to separate the canopies. Yeah, and, and, and if, if I could just add a comment, because at our last uh, iteration of this workshop a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, Cal Fire Chief Cindy Foreman was uh, the fire official who participated with us and she introduced a phrase that I didn't have in my lexicon before, which is receptive fuel bed. And it really, uh, it's a really great lens to use. I mean, to look at, for example, um, Chief Turbeville talked about cypress trees. And so what you often see is really dead leaf and branch build up within the perimeter of that tree, right? So they're likely never been maintained, probably unirrigated, um, right? So it's it's looking at that tree, that plant with a different lens of, is this a receptive fuel bed that will transmit fire to my home? And in that scenario, if you see all that dead buildup and debris within the interior of that plant or you know, shrub or tree, that's a high fire risk. So you want to be limbing it up, pruning it, maintaining it, getting that dead debris out if, if you're not going to remove it, but you're making the commitment to maintain it. Um, so if you're not going to maintain it, right? Um, but to Ellie's point, I mean, I live surrounded by beautiful heritage oak trees, right? So it, it's, it's, it's a maintenance issue for me in terms of keeping the leaf debris cleaned up, but I wouldn't trade that for anything. They're stunning and they're a you know, hugely important aspect is as both Ellie and April talked about for supporting biodiversity in our landscape. So it's about learning the coexisting and, and kind of having a different lens or view to how we look at our landscapes from both a, a sustainability perspective and a fire perspective. And that's what we're kind of hoping we, we helped communicate to you today. And I was just gonna add, in some ways, I, I know we talk about being resilient. I kind of view it as 
what would a fire have naturally done? So a fire would have burned almost not you know, five to 20% of California burned every year, which is what some of the studies say. Um, it wasn't all high intensity stand replacement, crown fires, treetop to treetop, everything burns. It'd be maybe a cool foggy morning versus an extreme windy August or fall day. So a surface fire would help the trees self prune or maybe it would even kill some of the smaller trees to keep the thinning alive. So we're trying to basically through landscaping, through prescribed burning, through grazing, other things be a, a surrogate for what fire would have naturally historically done. So in some ways there is some value and unfortunately of going and look at some of these burned areas, how the oak trees have now essentially self prune. Some of the dug firs have killed themselves off, how the manzanita has been invading our forest um, and been encroached upon our houses like you know, I, I don't want to name subdivisions, but it's out there to see. So, um, I'm, you know, trees are good. <laughs> Thank you. Good, 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 good final note. <laughs> I remember in college, there was a, there was a study written by, uh, I think it was Green, Greenpeace or something like that, about trees are the answer. And I keep going back to that, that, you know, they are, they are partially the answer. They are and, in many, many ways, whether it's carbon sequestration or biodiversity support or right on and on and on and on. Um, can I, can I, I just add a point about um, because I could I couldn't help but hear uh, Chief Tuberville say that Manzanita are invading the forest and and that may be true. It's I'm really curious about some of the Manzanita that are mixed in with uh, blue oak woodlands and other places um, and and it and it might I mean and they do tend to uh, burn when they have grasses growing up under them and, and if they're too dense. But on the other hand, um, manzanita are some of the, the shrubs that provide flowers in January, some of the only, only plants that provide um, food sources for uh, animals in the, for birds in, the, in January. And um, so it is possible to have some manzanita in your garden. And in some cases, it's a great plant to have as long as you keep it really well maintained. Yeah. And it, and again, I, I mean, I've, I've realized for myself, because, you know, I live in a fire prone area that I have not concentrated on maintenance and, you know, how we just really have to get ourselves to think about having a more intimate relationship with our gardens. And if, you know, if you have a lawn, you may be spending an hour or so a week mowing it and watering it. And so if you come, if you took that hour a week and you broke it and you, 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 clumped it to a couple of hours every month or I mean it turns out that there's a slightly less maintenance when you have native plants and you know Cleo and Mimi might want to speak to that but you, you may think it's more work but actually I, I believe it's less work. Yeah I, I uh, Ellie I was reading actually a very good way to think about this with California native plants and uh, think in terms of your maintenance, what would the fire, the flood, and the uh, wildlife do? So, you know, a hedge, they, the animals come and eat it, so you have to prune them. And, you know, think of, because you, you have it in a garden at home, you, you don't have the wildfire and the floods coming in and uh, maintaining it. So natives need to be maintained. And think of in terms of that, of how to trim them. Linda Collister, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate a portion of that, um, what, what Marshall Turberville had talked about, about the uh, manzanita. We did have a fire up on one of our open space where there was a lot of manzanita and chaparral or coyote bush with um, the oak trees. And it was really interesting because the fire, just like Ellie said, moved really fast through the grasses underneath the manzanita. It didn't give it time for the manzanita to start on fire uh, to create the ladder fields to move up into the um, oak trees. And also as a, Ellie, your drawings, I love your drawings. And maybe what you can do is, is um, you know, make a note of there for people planting new trees mm -hmm. or, um, to do that separation. Whereas, you know, the existing trees like Marshall had said that we tried to lift and then separate and, uh, remove the ladder fuel. So all great conversations. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Very helpful. And then I also wanted to, um, uh, Priscilla made a comment in the chat box about bamboo and, you know, um, same kind of thing, consideration about all the dead debris that accumulates within that dense stand of bamboo is what's creating the higher fire risk of that. 
um, super hard to eradicate once it's been established. But, uh, you know, maybe take a lens to thinning out stands, right? So it's not such, a, not just a receptive field bed, but such a receptive zone for leafy debris and matter to accumulate because that's what's really helping to contribute to the problem, so. I find that screening is such a big issue in the rebuild phase that people all want their screening back. And so thinking about like what, the, I, I'm hearing people, I keep saying no bamboo, no bamboo, but like they, they're like, oh, it's fast and it's big. And so just really thinking about the future, like you're, it's not yeah. gonna be fun when that gets out and, and starts yeah. spreading around. Yeah. <laughs> so your screening is important, but there's all kinds of native shrubs that can be wonderful for that and, and fast <laughs> go under your decks and can pierce the the deck uh, the decking <laughs> okay. any other comments or questions I, I don't see any questions i think everybody is i th either it was the most incredible presentation <laughs> we're past we're past our you know but if people thought they were leaving at noon and it's a beautiful day then you know yeah. <laughs> you might not want to prolong the, the meeting. Thank Sounds you, like Marshall may have some um, tidbits of wisdom just from his experience that he wants to share. Yeah, if, if you don't mind, I just want to kind of say a couple things and I'm not, remember, these are all just experiences and things I've seen and it's, you know, just to kind of take it with a grain of salt or maybe start the discussion, but uh, fences, um, I know it's been talked about fences being Wix house to house. But um, I would say the reason oak part of most of oak barn didn't burn from the glass fire was that wood fence caught all the leaves, caught all the low flying embers. And then once the fence caught, it kind of was a delay for the firefighters to get there and put it out before it actually got to the house or all those leaves would have just blown up against the house. So, um, you know, I know there's some fancy metals out there now and other non combustible stuff as well as just maybe as you're doing your terracing for hillside erosion and such that fire could creep up to that you know, whatever it is, even if it's a railroad tie, I hate to say that with creosote and stuff, but um, that will give us time to get there or slow that fire down. And even if it's day seven, day 10, as we saw in one of the glass fire structure losses, you know, time sometimes just helps us out a little bit. So the idea about fences and retaining walls and things. And then the second thing is something I've been thinking about, and I don't know, you know, I know drought's a concern and everything else, but late summer, early fall watering. I'm seeing more and more people turn sprinklers on for the thought of the leaves in their gutter to wet the vegetation down, but many times the vegetation's dead. It's, you know, it's good, but it's gonna evaporate in these warm, dry conditions. So, you know, I'm just thinking about this. If, if you have mowed dry grass, maybe start irrigating in August, September to get a little bit of green regrowth, that'll slow a fire because now it's a live fuel or what we call live vegetation. I'm sure there's some more scientific word for that, um, or slow the fire growth. So there are some observations, maybe some science will come along with this, but just some things I've kind of been noticing because that, that green grass will catch the ember, put it out perhaps, or slow a fire down as it comes towards the, the building, so. Great. I just want to take the opportunity to thank everyone for this wonderful presentation. I mean, deep in science, as a scientist myself, I really appreciate um, hearing uh, presentations that are based on science and, and also on a depth of experience. I mean, you all are so experienced and Marshall has embellished that with his experience as a firefighter. Um, and it, wow. Um, thank you so much. Just, uh, I think this is super helpful for our COPE leaders and for our communities to have this information. So thank you again for doing this for us. Thanks for hosting us, Priscilla. Um, Appreciate great. it. Yeah, thank you, Priscilla. It was great. <laughs> great, thanks. Well, we'll have an ongoing relationship, you know, and okay. figure out how to, over time, um, present more information. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, send us that Wendell Berry or the what was the name of that that poem? Um, it is from the Peace of Wild Things. Okay. Mimi, did you want to tell people that we will email them a PDF of the slide presentation? Thank you. So we'll follow up for everybody who uh, for who all folks who RSVP'd, we'll send a follow up email with a link to the recording. Um, as well as the wonderful Google Doc that Cleo was keeping tracking all the links that she was sharing. And we'll do, we'll combine all three of our presentations. It was a lot of content into a PDF 
and share that as a resource for you guys to use um, moving forward as well. So watch for an email, uh, probably, maybe not next week. We'll see <laughs> if Thanksgiving gets in the way, but, but early around December, the first. Yeah, around the yeah, first early, December. early December at the latest. And I'm a, um, from a firefighter point of view, um, I think this is kind of the why behind the laws and the regulations. And so if you just go out there black and white, um, so whether we're doing inspections, talking to community groups, this is the why, this is the reason, this is, I mean, a better uh, customer service to present this type of presentation versus just a hey, cut your grass, do X, Y, Z. This is the why behind, the theory behind. And so I think this type of presentation is very valuable for, for firefighters too. Oh, so uh, if you would like us to do some presentations to firefighters, we would be happy to. We, I, I right, we're nodding. Yeah, absolutely. Our <laughs> yeah. that was, that's part of our long-term plan. We've been trying to get grant funding to do a much more comprehensive outreach program, but um, Chief, more than happy to do a presentation to you. Yeah, I think even just a recording of this one, um, I know it's two hours to sit through, but it's just, it's, it's really good. And I sometimes joke about firefighters, it's either a black tree or a green tree. They don't know deciduous <laughs> evergreens, conifers, dicots, you know, all that stuff. And so um, they just know whether it burns or not. And they're seeing these yeah. things burn more in the summer, fall, worst case conditions. And then, so they're telling people to clear cut everything. Well, that that's right. great. I mean, you got to can't manage just for one thing. So that is right. erosion and everything else. So I think this is this is great for, for like an all depth analysis uh, approach. That's, thank you. That's a big part of what we're trying to communicate. Great. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. Let everyone take care. Take care. Bye. Ellie and Mimi, could we stay on and just sure. for a little? Yeah. Bye, Olivia. Bye, right. everybody. Bye, Thank you. There's a cute kitty with a crown. Oh. <laughs>